Hello, I'm Dr. Ashok Jansari and I'm a cognitive neuropsychologist at Goldsmiths University of London. And what that means is that I study people with brain damage and also people without brain damage to try to understand how our brains function, to allow us to do things like remember things, recognize people around us, how to plan, etc. And today what I'm going to talk about is how we recognize our loved ones or people around us. So how do you recognize your mother or a partner or someone like that? Now the way it works is that first of all, light bounces from the person's face into your eyes. So light is bouncing off of me into your eyes. And I'm going to use my friend here, Frank, to help us demonstrate. So basically, light is bouncing off of me into Frank's eyes. And then at the back of Frank's eyes is a screen called the retina. And that screen picks up information um, about what is being seen. But it's lots of little bits of information. It can't see a face. So then Frank's eyes have got that screen that sends the information to the back of the brain here. And the back of the brain around this area here above his ears, that area starts looking at the information that's th that's come in and it starts grouping it and it sees color, edges and movement. And slowly by processes that we're still trying to work out, the brain starts working out that there's a shape here. And when it works out that there's a shape here, if this is the shape, a coffee mug, then certain types of visual processing happen. But in a way that we still don't understand, the brain can work out, oh, look, there's a human face. And what it does is it then sends the information into a different area and their face processing happens. Now, from lots of research on both people with brain damage and people without brain damage, we realize that four things happen at the same time. The first is that Frank can recognize me looking at him straight on or from the side or from that side. And he can create an image in his eye of me and then he can rotate it in his mind's eye to work out who, uh, who I might be. The second thing is that I might be looking sad or I might be looking happy. Frank can tell what emotion I'm showing from my face. Another really clever thing that Frank can do, and we, I bet you didn't realize you can do this, is lip reading. Now, we hear about people who are really good at lip reading, but did you know that you can lip read? Now, we know this because of a really uh, interesting phenomenon, which is like a visual illusion called the McGurk effect. And the McGurk effect demonstrates that we're lip reading while we're listening to people. Now, it's difficult to explain here, and I might do a little video about that another time. But just think about if you're watching a live news broadcast or a football match or a, a sporting event where because of a problem in the Internet, there's a delay between the picture and the sound. What you'll find is that when you're looking at people who are saying something and there's a small delay, even like half a second, it will start jarring and sound and look weird. Now, if all you were doing was hearing the person, then there wouldn't be any difference whatsoever. But the fact that there's a, a half second delay between the picture and the sound creates this confusion. And that demonstrates that actually we're lip reading and our brain is set up such that it's expecting to see certain lip movements when it hears things and when it doesn't it gets thrown into confusion and we know this from people with brain damage who either show the McGurk effect or don't show the McGurk effect now the final thing that Frank can do is recognize me as Ashok rather than just as another person so to recap we've got four things that happen at the same time Frank can um, see that there's a person here and recognize me from different angles. So he can create an image of me in his mind's eye, back here somewhere. And from that, he can rotate it in his mind's eye to match a picture that he has of me. 
The second thing is that he can um, process emotion and work out what sort of emotion I'm showing, whether I'm happy, sad, angry, etc. The third is that he can read my lips. And the fourth is that he knows who I am. Now, one of the most powerful ways that we know that these th four things happen in parallel at the same time is that you can have patients who lose one of these abilities, but are still okay in the others. And we have complex combinations called double dissociations where this can happen. So for example, there are some patients who can tell what emotion I'm showing, but not know who I am. And then there are other patients who can't tell you what emotion I'm showing, but they know who I am. So they're completely opposite to one another. And when you get that, that's called a double dissociation. And what that demonstrates is that those two processes happen at exactly the same time. And those parallel processes are really powerful for helping us understand the complexity of the human brain. Now, once Frank has seen who I am, there's a number of different processes that happen one after another. So the first thing that happens is that when Frank is trying to recognize me, he looks in his brain, not consciously, it happens without him thinking about it, looks for a picture in his brain on his hard drive or in his Google search or whatever you want to call it, somewhere stored in here. There's a picture of me. And today I'm looking different to the way Frank has seen me before, but Frank's got a picture of me in his head. And what happens is Frank matches the picture that he's seeing right now with the picture that he's got in his hard drive. And when he, that match happens, that's when he says, oh, I've seen that person before. And that's called face recognition. The next thing that happens is that Frank's brain then says, okay, you've seen this person before, but tell me something about this person. And Frank says, oh, he's the person that I live with. Um, he owns this flat and I sit on top of his bookshelf. So he finds out some information about me, which is how he knows me. So in your case, you would be thinking, oh, here's this person I recognize. And that recognition leads me to, oh, that's my mother. So that is your information about someone. It's kind of like your dictionary of who that person is, what information you have. And that's what we in psychology call our semantic information. Now, the final thing that happens is that Frank says, oh, okay, so I recognize that person. He's the person I live with. It's in his flat that I live. And he's called Ashok. And that's called name generation. So what we get is three different processes that happen. First, you recognize. Second, you get the meaning information called semantic information. And then third, you get the name. And these three things happen one after another. So you'll never say, oh, that's Ashok, but I've never seen him again before and I don't recognize him. You, ha you can only get to name recognition after you've recognized someone and you've got some information about them. And we know this because of lots of different studies that have demonstrated that even healthy people sometimes will not remember someone's name. You know, like you can recognize someone and think, oh, I know they were in that TV drama and blah, 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 but you can't remember their name. That's called the tip of the tongue phenomenon. And that simply means that you, you're almost there, but you can't remember who the person is. So tip of the tongue phenomenon with people's names shows us that name recognition happens last. Now, we also know that in some disorders like the unfortunate dementias and dementia, Alzheimer's, what can happen is that an individual um, forgets the name of their child, but they know it's their child. And that's because the name recognition is the last thing in the system. And it's the first one to get affected by this disease. And then what happens a bit later on, unfortunately, is that the semantic information that they're, uh, they're actually their son or their husband, that goes. And then finally, they don't have any recognition at all. So we know from lots of different types of evidence, from healthy young people, from people with brain damage, and from people with these degenerative disorders, such as Alzheimer's, that the face processing system is really complex and it happens at a number of these layers. So 
we find so much about the brain by studying these different types of groups. Now, all of this has been brought together in different models, and if you're interested, two extremely important British psychologists, uh, Vicky Bruce and Andy Young, created a face recognition model in 1986, and if you want to know more about it, I'd be happy to give you some answers. So, I hope you've enjoyed finding out about how Frank recognises me and how you recognise your mother or your partner. Um, I, if you've got any questions, please put them in the comment section. Please like this video, tell others about it, subscribe to my channel. And if you've got ideas for future videos, then just let us know because I'd like to create more videos to help you understand how the fascinating brain works. So from Frank and myself, goodbye.